welcome to The Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. My name's Kenny McBride and I'm joined today by two excellent guests. Firstly, by the General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Unions Congress, Ros Foyers. Ros, how are you doing today? Very good, thanks. Excellent. And on the other side of me is Andrew Wilson from the All Under One Banner organisation. Andrew, how are you doing today? Kenny, good afternoon. I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm not bad at all. And we will, of course, be talking to Andrew about yesterday's events with the All Under One Banner Assembly a wee bit later on. But first, we have a coronavirus statistics update for you. These figures are as of 2pm yesterday. Today's figures obviously will be published about two hours from now. But yesterday, there were 1,118 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Scotland. Uh, there were 36 new reported deaths as well. A total of 1,079,372 people in Scotland have been tested. Of these, 999,237 were confirmed negative, 80,135 were positive. Uh, last night, uh, where there were 1,198 people in hospital uh, with COVID, 92 of whom were in intensive care. And those 36 deaths take the total of patients who have tested positive in Scotland and then died within 28 days to 3,280. So obviously our commiserations to everyone who has lost somebody. Um, but uh, we do move on now to talk about some of the rest of this week's news. And of course, some of the biggest news coming out of Westminster this week was the departure from number 10 of Dominic Cummings, uh, formerly uh, the mastermind behind the Vote Leave campaign, one of Boris Johnson and uh, Michael Gove's closest allies in the, the civil service and the campaigning organisations. Uh, but Cummings is gone after allegedly falling out quite seriously with Boris Johnson. So... Uh, Andrew, I think I'll come to you first on this. Uh, what did you make of Dominic Cummings' departure? This is something that came quite suddenly, I think. There were not a lot of rumours about this before it happened. And then suddenly, he's gone. Uh, do you think this is the last we've seen of Dominic Cummings in, in public service? Well, I think, Kenny, the, the, the reporting around about events in Westminster and in Downing Street in particular this week, I, I think it's pretty clear it must have been scripted by Armando Iannucci. It has all the look and feel of, of, a, of a, the thick of it Christmas special, frankly. Uh, the, uh, I think it indicates the, I think it indicates very clearly that, that whilst it's said that Mr. Cummings, uh, or as he's now known, Dominic Goings, uh, is, 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 is an excellent uh, organiser of political campaigns. When it comes to actually running a government and when it comes to attempting to implement all of the fantastical things that he writes about in his blog, that he's not able to do it. He's not up to the task. So I think his departure might suggest that somehow the current Westminster government might start to stumble in a slightly less incompetent direction. Uh, but I'm not holding out any hope because I think it's clear that the the the, the fascination for intrigue and and uh, small p political uh, agendas within Downing Street, which I think is in at least in part as, as a result of the very poor cabinet who were appointed by the Prime Minister in order to pursue his hard Brexit ambitions, uh, I think the combination of uh, uh, of advisors who are, are are not good at advising as to how you run a government, uh, combined with a very Poor cabinet uh, has led to this uh, this uh, uh, bloodbath is too strong a word, but this succession of very senior uh, departures, uh, 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 which necessarily means that we're wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, I, I, I think there's certainly doubt that John, that the prime minister, has much of a uh, much of a policy agenda apart from uh, promoting the prime minister. Uh, so I think perhaps uh, everything's to play for now. Mm. And Roz, um, obviously a lot of people, you know, quite happy to see the back of Dominic Cummings, felt he was a, a really malign influence on politics. But of course, the, the politicians who gave him a, a series of jobs and then protected him uh, when he broke uh, quarantine rules and potentially, you know, broke other things during the Vote Leave campaign. Um, do you think this will actually make any big difference to how this government operates? 
No, I don't. And I, I think, Kenny, that Andrew's quite right when he talks about this being scripted. In my view, it's too scripted. A, a trick of the Tories over a long period of time is to have a bogeyman of some sorts. And I think that it's suited the Johnson government to keep coming as the bad cop for quite some time uh, and, and to try and get Boris off the hook. And uh, they've decided to deploy that particular tool at this point in time to try and resuscitate his, his uh, image in the polls, or Johnson, that is. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a government that's completely incompetent over Brexit. They're, they're taking decisions like putting 20% on the price of PPE and face masks right in the middle of a pandemic. Their public safety messaging has been nothing sort of sort of dangerous. And the way that they flip-flopped and delayed on decision making around the furlough scheme has literally cost tens of thousands of people across Scotland their job. Uh, I could go on, I, you know, things like the internal market bill, the slap in the face that is for devolution. Uh, all of these things have added up to a series of bad mistakes recently for that government. So I think they've just decided that this is a, a good PR tool to signal a change in direction. Whether it will be a real change in direction, I think, uh, is highly doubtful. Mm. Now, we had heard for some time that Cummings' plan was get Brexit done and then effectively take a step back and become more of a sort of ideas man, a blue sky thinker for the government uh, and let someone else take over as the, the Prime Minister's chief of staff. He's left now just a few weeks earlier um, and we're expecting this week to find out what the Brexit deal is. Um, essentially this week we need to see something. Uh, do you think that Cummings' departure tells us anything about what kind of deal might be on the table. I sincerely hope there is going to be some sort of deal on the table. But yet again, we're, we're sitting in a situation where that deal is very, very late for businesses to be able to plan. Uh, this is like a perfect storm between the, the worry people have over the coronavirus and the, the deep damage that the style of Brexit that the UK government has brought upon us all uh, is doing to our economy. Uh, we're going to have massive impacts. But I have uh, deep worries whether Dominic Cummings is there or not. Uh, we are dealing with a uh, right-wing Tory government based on nationalist populism. And what I mean by that is they like to play on division between working classes. And I have few fear that we're going to have an exit that's not good for working people. And, you know, some of the trade deals that are going to be coming up in the future as well, this is effectively a trade deal with Europe that we're waiting for, but we need to keep our eyes open for trade deals with other countries as well because they could seriously undermine workers' rights. They could undermine the fair work agenda that we have here in Scotland. They could undermine our environmental agenda and our food standards. So we're going to have to become very, very acquainted to the sort of trade deals that are going to take place moving forward now. Mm. Now, Andrew, coming back to you, uh, this issue of Brexit, it's, it's expected that it has to come to a head this week. Uh, there's only so much time left for all the parliaments involved, all the, the EU parliaments, uh, the EU parliament, the EU's own parliament and the British parliament to all ratify the deal if there is one done. What's your suspicion about uh, where we are with that? Are you expecting to see something, some rabbit pulled out of the hat this week? Uh, Kenny, well, I think I think there's been reporting this week that the the, the EU is making plans to, if necessary, hold uh, meetings in the week between Christmas and New Year, uh, if that is required in order to finally get a deal over the line. And that that strikes me as unusual and depressing, but uh, necessary. Well, it also strikes me as the sort of proper planning that the, an institution like the EU does, and which a, 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 an organisation like the current Westminster government doesn't do. Uh, so I think uh, I, 
I, I think the I think the changes in uh, advisors in Downing Street make a deal less make 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 a deal less likely because there will be ongoing confusion and a lack of lack of direction uh, in Downing Street. I know in the press the Prime Minister's position has been being portrayed yesterday as being he's the hardest in the room and the the most determined negotiator. Uh, that the press are having to spin that line suggests that he is in fact the complete opposite to me. Uh, so I think we I think the 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 the, the likelihood is that the discussions will continue further, and it will get tighter and tighter and tighter. Uh, I, I I I think the Prime Minister is faced now with the prospect of either. Uh, 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 in, in the context of Brexit more generally, the prospect of either uh, having no Brexit uh, or having a united Ireland uh, or, the, or, the, or the, the UK becoming some sort of international pariah state. Uh, and, and I think even he will recognise the seriousness of the decision that he has to take in that context. Uh, I, I think the determination to continue to, you know, the apparent determination to take the ball, to take the can further down the road, closer to the end of the year. Uh, is 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 typical, uh, but it's also typically worrying, uh, and so we 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 were told that there were uh, it was expected that that uh, the middle of October was the was the drop dead date for this deal. Here we are now in the middle of November, uh, and we're, and I don't think we're actually making progress. There's still too much on the table yet to be fixed. So I think the prospect is still of a is is still for a, a no deal Brexit, frankly. Mm. And just to return to Dominic Cummings for one wee second, Andrew, uh, with Dominic Cummings gone, what are Robert Peston and Laura Koonsberg, how are they going to know what to tweet now? You make a very good point, Kenny. Uh, the, 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 two, uh, the two unappointed uh, directors of communication for Boris Johnson, uh, Ms Koonsberg and Mr Peston, uh, I think Peston in particular has been made to look very foolish this week, having to retract various things that he said. Oh, and I should say, I think Rosie's point about uh, being scripted is absolutely right. The political theatre of coming standing on the doorstep of Downing Street with a cardboard box in his hands was ridiculous, and it fools nobody. Uh, so uh, the 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 events of this of this of the last few days are shown to be uh, a stitch up, a political job. Uh, possibly very well, possibly for the reasons that Ross explained. Uh, and I think in terms of Kunzberg and Preston, uh, they are firstly, uh, whatever whatever professional standing they had left is damaged again. Uh, and, the, and, and the standing of the news organisations, who they front, like it or not, has been damaged again. Uh, I'm confident that in the context of the Westminster bubble, they will establish relations. They'll, they, will, they will undoubtedly either have worked with in the past or will be very closely related to whoever it is that comes in uh, uh, in the future and, and tells them what to tweet. So in a sense, there's no, there's no change. In another sense, there's a continuing deterioration in the, in the standing and standard uh, of political journalism in the UK. Mm. I am proud to say that nobody here at Broadcasting Scotland is in a group chat with Dominic Cummings. So that's something we can say that's positive about us. Um, but we, we mentioned in amongst all this discussion of Brexit uh, that we are still, of course, dealing with a pandemic. Um, we've seen some very high case numbers, some very high numbers of deaths in the last week. Um, and Roz, I'd I think I'd like to come to you first on this, uh, because obviously in the last couple of weeks we've seen some uh, difficulties, let's say, in uh, with the furlough scheme and the, the other sort of support that's available for, for jobs and businesses. Um, how do you feel the, the UK government particularly has handled things over the last few weeks in terms of extending the furlough scheme and their, their other support that they're offering to, to citizens? Well, I think they've handled it disgracefully. We've had a situation where we had workers who were refusing restrictions in, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, in the North of England, with their own issues here in Scotland. All of these areas had been calling out consistently, including the trade union, for the government to extend its furlough scheme. Since, since back in the summer, we've been calling on Chancellor to think again and make sure that they put a proper safety net in place for businesses and most importantly to protect thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs. And what we ended up with 
was a government that made the decision at the 11th hour when they realised that workers in the south east were going to be affected and that they were going to have to police the play because they had an acted sooner and a more proactive way into a lockdown phase to stop the virus running out of control. And only at that point did they think it was important to extend the thermal scheme, get a grip and do what they should have done months ago, which was extend it through to next March. Now, while that news is welcome, it's come far too late for far too many workers. And so there's a tragic irony in the way that this scheme has been extended. And, and it's like so much of the, the rest of the thinking of the UK government on this, taking decisions far too late when they're forced into it. Uh, and, that, and that is something that at least we've got a government here in Scotland that's tried to plan ahead. But the, the problem the Scottish government has is that they have the they have the will to put public safety first, but they don't necessarily have the means to put the support package in place that's required. And, government's not working together and it's essential that all politics are put aside and that our governments are forced to work together on these issues and I would place the onus on the UK government to get a grip and start doing that. Mm. Now obviously there are a lot of issues affecting workers during this pandemic. Uh, we've seen, for example, challenges for some workers getting the PPE that they needed. Uh, some workers obviously have been laid off or, or not been not even been had access to furlough scheme. I wonder though, um, for the the STUC, um, what's been your your feeling about the way that workers, uh, perhaps who aren't unionized, have been affected? We know that obviously. Workers in shops, for example, often aren't unionised, uh, but they've been having to keep working throughout this this pandemic. Um, has the STUC got any uh, connection with sort of the non-unionised sectors that have that have taken a big, uh, that have had a lot of difficulties during the pandemic? Yeah, well, for, firstly, um, if I can say that we have we have many workers in shops who are unionised, sure. but yeah. you're right, there are many workers who are not. We have uh, been very much uh, liaising with workers in these areas, and actually, we're just uh, we're just we're launching a report tomorrow about workers in the in the the hospitality and the culture areas. Mm. Because you know, even those there are many workers that fall into the cracks in these areas. They're not even covered by the policy. If you look at people like taxi drivers or musicians. Uh, like people in our culture industry, a lot of those workers are technically self employed and have had zero support during this pandemic just because of the way the rules work. They're not big enough to get the business support and they're not classed as employees so they can't get the furlough support. So there are many people in severe financial hardship. But we have been working through our projects for better than zero. But many young workers, many women in detail and hospitality and areas of like cinemas who are getting organised, coming together and we've supported them to actually make sure that they get added to the furlough scheme in areas where their employer may have chosen not to, uh, try and make sure that they get paid their full wages rather than uh, a percentage of their wages. Although we have to be aware that Almost 200,000 workers in Scotland have had to work below minimum wage levels. But the way the furlough scheme works means that you only get 80% of your wages. And if you're on the minimum wage, that means you fall well below the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So that, that poverty is a big issue for these workers. That's really starting to bite. And the precarity in those industries and, and the way that that hospitality has been totally the queue for getting closed down has obviously meant a severe hardship. And we need to remember as well that it's mostly young workers uh, that are affected in these areas. So they, they don't necessarily have the support network that, that others might have. And also, Ros, um how have the, the, the UK and the, the Scottish government and perhaps the councils as well how have they been with the the union movement throughout this? Has has there been a lot of kind of coordination and 
and discussion with your with your members, or is this something where unions are having to fight to be heard? I have to say that we have had excellent access with the Scottish Government and we have been engaging intensely as a union movement uh, since the very beginning of this pandemic. Uh, we've been having weekly, sometimes uh, two and three times a week meetings uh, with Scottish Government ministers. Uh, we've been centrally involved in providing guidance for workers across all sectors and how employers should respond to this pandemic. Uh, we have made our voice heard in the, the, the regulations and the safety messaging that needed to go out, and we've produced a joint fair work framework uh, that, that recommends how employers in Scotland should be treating workers in relation to this pandemic. So we've been front and centre of making sure that the workers' voices are heard and that the right response to this crisis has been brought forward, but there are still a range of areas where we're not happy, we don't always get what we want, mm -hmm. but we have been fully engaged in that debate. Okay, well that's good news I suppose. Um, Andrew, I'll turn back to you now. and. Uh... We also heard this week that there's a, vi a vaccine uh, kind of on the horizon. The Pfizer uh, drug company has produced a vaccine which seems to have a 90% effectiveness rate, which is much better than anybody was expecting. Um, there was talk uh, that this might be rolled out as soon as Christmas. Um, that does seem like a very, very short time scale, though. How hopeful are you, though, that a, a vaccine is going to be available within, you know, sometime in the next few months? Yeah, well, I'm, Kenny, I'm certainly very hopeful. Uh, and I think there are indications uh, that, uh, that that the, that there is a high level of expectation that that will come about. Uh, I'm aware of preparations uh, in the health service uh, and in the construction industry uh, in connection with uh, providing facilities uh, and organisations to uh, to administer this vaccine to to vaccinate 66 million people is going to be is a is a is a significant task, and as we've seen, especially south of the border, uh, getting organised and getting uh, processes and systems running effectively and efficiently has been a real challenge. Uh, so uh, I, I I I have I have I have a degree of faith in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, especially the degree of collaboration that we have seen to produce this these particular vaccines. And there are, as I understand it, there are a number of vaccines which are uh, progressing. It is simply that the Pfizer is at the front. The Pfizer BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine is at the front of the queue uh, in terms of its uh, development. Uh, but I think I think there is there is plenty there, there is certainly plenty of evidence that there is an expectation that a vaccine will become available in the next very few months. Uh, the challenge then will be getting it uh, administered to as many people in the right order uh, as efficiently and effectively as possible, uh, and and I think that is where uh, that is where I think the major challenge is going to lie. Mm. Well, we will obviously keep watching to see what does happen with that. But we move on now to look across the Atlantic and Joe Biden, uh, the president-elect now, um, it now it sits on about 300, on, oh, it now sits on 306 electoral college votes. Uh, this is what Trump called a landslide when he got it. Um, but obviously Trump has a slightly different perspective on uh, when it's Joe Biden that's winning. Um, Joe Biden, we heard this week, had won Arizona, uh, had won Georgia by something like 14,000 votes. Uh, both states, I believe, are now holding recounts. Uh, but Andrew, I'll come to you now. Uh, the, Donald Trump has continued uh, pretty much consistently since Election Day back on November the 3rd uh, to say that there's something wrong, the, the votes are not real, they're bogus, it's all a fraud. Um, what do you make of the way the president has reacted and do you think it's going to have any impact? Well, I suppose in a sense the, 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 the sight and sound and the tweets of the, of the current president raging against the dying of his political light uh, are perhaps the, the necessary denouement to the, the, the very brief Trump presidency. Uh, I think the uh, I, I, I don't think that his posturing and uh, tweeting is going to make any difference. 
<coughs> excuse me, I think that despite his attempts to dis to dismantle many of the important institutions and structures of the United States over the last few uh, over the last few years. I think he has been unsuccessful in completing that project, and as a result, we are seeing that, in particular, state uh, institutions—not uh, federal institutions—the state institutions are still robust, and are well run, and are well re organised, uh, and are standing up well to his uh, attempts to uh, attack them. Uh, I think that he has appointed Rudy Giuliani to mastermind his legal campaign. Tells us precisely how successful that's going to be. Uh, and I think there's a recognition that the, that the game is pretty much up for him. Uh, I, I suspect in the background we are starting to see manoeuvres both by Trump and the, I was, well, the, the Trump mafia, the family, uh, uh, moves by them to begin to protect themselves. There will, I think, be attempts by the family to maximise its revenue from the, from, the, from, the, from the United States in the next few weeks to make sure that they can make off with as much loot as possible. But also, they will be starting to move in the process, in the progress, in the process of working out how they can arrange pardons. Uh, I think we might see some interesting legal shenanigans uh, between now and the twentieth of January, uh, including a continued look at whether the president can uh, temporarily step down. Uh, the vice president then provides the former president with a pardon, uh, and then the former president steps back up and becomes the president again. I know that under Nixon, that was certainly looked at. And I suspect that Trump would look at that again and might try it. Uh, so I think that's where the activities are going to be, but it's not going to change the result of the election. Mm. And Roz, we've seen this week Trump has uh, removed a lot of senior civilian personnel from the Pentagon and replaced them with people he considers a lot more loyal to him. Now, some people suggested that this might be somebody preparing for a military coup. I mean, does, does something like that seem plausible to you? Well, when it comes to Trump, anything plausible, I'm afraid. I mean, this is uh, an individual who has stolen the politics of sheer hatred, who's divided a country, and the negativity uh, that his presidency has, has created uh, has probably pretty unprecedented for any American president. I'd like to just highlight one of the most positive things for me was the election of Kamala Harris as, as the vice president. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, coming back from uh, the, the years we've lived through of a Trump president, the uh, uh, first black women uh, take up that level of role, I think it's significant and should be welcomed. But, you know, for me, the, these are going to be very dangerous, potentially dangerous weeks. I don't think anyone really predicts uh, how some might choose to react. And there are a lot of very dangerous groups and people on the far right that he has whipped up to support him. Uh, you know, demonst I've seen demonstrations, people on the street armed to the teeth. Uh, it looks to me like he's trying to build a militia, uh, if not, he might influence the Pentagon. And I think if he thought he'd get the support, he probably would uh, make whatever moves he needed to make to stay in power, such as his level of uh, unhingedness. Mm. Yeah. So we're in dangerous times. I just hope that people in America stay safe. I think ultimately the state will remove them in January, but I think there are going to be several scary weeks before we get to that point and I just hope that you know the fewest number of people possible get hurt in these coming weeks. Yeah, absolutely. We do wish our very best to our friends on the other side of the Atlantic. Well, we come back hey, to the UK just... now, and uh, Pretty Patel has been attacked again over the discussion of plans to build offshore uh, detention centres for people claiming asylum here in the UK. Uh, Stuart MacDonald MP, the SNP's Shadow Immigration Minister, has written to Pretty Patel about this following uh, Home Affairs uh, Committee evidence from Madeleine Gleeson, who is a, an expert on the Australian asylum system. And she warned that obviously the Australian system was extremely damaging to the people uh, who had to go through that system. Um, so I'll come to you first, Andrew. Um, 
Priti Patel uh, has not been known as the most uh, perhaps humane Home Secretary the UK has ever had. Uh, how seriously do you take this idea of uh, offshore detention centres and, and things like that? Is this just a, a distraction from a system that doesn't appear to be working very well and a, a, a minister who has been uh, plagued by controversy? Or is this something that you think she is really planning? Well, Kenny, I think in, in terms of immigration policy, Priti Patel is following in a, in a, in a, in a very well-trodden path of uh, recent Conservative uh, Home Secretaries. And I'm thinking in particular of Theresa May, who dreamt up and implemented the hostile environment and all of the pain and suffering and horror that that, that environment and that policy has, has wrought on people. Uh, I think uh, uh, we know that uh, Ms Patel has extremely right-wing views on a number of things, including uh, supporting the death penalty. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the discussions this week with regard to, and, and in previous weeks, with regard to, as you put it, as you say, offshoring, quote unquote, uh, uh, the uh, detention of uh, asylum seekers uh, is something which throws red meat uh, to her right-wing chums. Uh, so I think there's a degree of uh, unvirtue signalling going on from the from the from the current Home Secretary. Uh, I struggle to see how it would be possible to organise it in any manner that would be effective and legal, uh, either under the current law in the UK or in the, under law after we leave uh, after the 31st of December. So there would be very significant challenges uh, to that. So I, I think, on balance, the prospects for it are limited. Uh, but I think that uh, she will continue to talk about it because uh, her supporters like like that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, Roz, the the UK government, the, these Tories uh, do like to whip up rage against immigrants and especially against asylum seekers and refugees uh, when when things are tough for them. Uh, what do you make of the the way Pretty Patel has has been talking and acting over the last wee while? Do you do you what do you think it's more of a more of a performance, as you say, throwing red meat to the to the base, or is there a genuine attempt to to do something about the immigration system in the UK? There's no there's no doubt that we need to do something about the immigration system in the UK, that's for sure. Uh, we need to build a more humane immigration system where immigrants and, and children who are fleeing war and financial destitution are not uh, dying trying to get their chores for a start. But it's absolutely true that this government is clinically uh, and you know, using, and it's, it's exactly what got Trump in, it's the campaign that got Brexit through, the cynical use of uh, hatred and division. And unfortunately, at the time when people are going through hard times, uh, the economics are challenging, uh, that is the time when the politics of division can be cool. And we have a conservative government that has very cynically used those politics of division uh, to, to give people someone to blame and we love giving them the, the immigrants to blame for all society's problems. Mm. Uh, and this is just more of that messaging, sadly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will obviously keep an eye on that and discuss it for more if there are more developments. But we, we move on a wee bit now, and there's a report today that the UK is expecting to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars starting in 2030, just 10 years away from today. Uh, this would obviously be a, a big step in reducing uh, the UK's climate uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, and improving on our climate targets. Um, Ros, let me come to you first on this. Um, a, a, an awful lot of uh, green campaigners will argue that the, the transition to a, to a greener economy, to a zero carbon economy, is going to be a big job creator. And obviously, you know, building more electric cars would potentially create jobs. What's the, the STU's, STUC's position on, on this? Is there, would, would you like to be seeing more ambitious targets than this? And perhaps you know turn turn the UK into a centre of electric car manufacture. Absolutely, uh, there's 
we produced a, a document that set out uh, the level of investment that we feel is required. Uh, and this was just for Scotland uh, to create green jobs, sustainable jobs going forward. And, and the biggest problem is that the 140,000 green jobs we estimated that you're probably looking at about £13 billion worth of investment. And, and pre-market economies are not going to help us have a just transition to a green economy. We're going to need the government to take a proper stake in investing in our manufacturing sector, investing in, in our infrastructure uh, and our energy sector. And at the moment, we're not doing that. We're talking the talk of a green recovery, but we're not putting the level of investment and industrial strategy in that's required. So workers have got very low confidence at the moment that the type of investment required to make sure that, you know, proper green jobs are built in Scotland. That's just not there. I'll give you an example. We have got right now five billion pounds of wind turbine contracts to build offshore wind. Now this is something we've known about for ten years or more. And we have the bifab yard lying dormant and about to go into administration that could have built those jackets if it had proper investment. Instead, we have 160 jackets with the wind turbines now being built at the other side of the world. Mm. Now, investment rules need to be spoken to our government to put the right level of investment in, but that's really not a good enough answer. So we need to make sure that if we're talking about, you know, banning uh, diesel cars, that we're actually looking at how do we have cottage jobs, UK jobs that are involved in building electric cars. We need to look at cottage jobs, electrifying our roads and making sure the right charging centres are there. We need to look at good high quality public transport and putting jobs into that. And, and look at things like our housing stock, uh, retrofitting our housing to make it more energy efficient, setting up a national construction company, a national energy company to actually enable the right strategy to go into place and create the jobs that are going to create a just transition. Mm. That isn't happening just now. All right. Well, Andrew, let me turn to you on this. Um, this uh, this question of uh, you know, switching to, to all uh, or no non-carbon cars, potentially, you know, hydrogen or electric, electricity, uh, whatever it may be. Um, is this the, the right move, do you think, or do you think it might make more sense to to focus on uh, expanding public transport massively or, or potentially even discouraging transport uh, as, as a whole? Do you think that might be a, 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 a more useful strategy? Well, I think I think first of all, Kenny, did I hear you suggesting that a Tory government had suddenly discovered a, a desire for green credentials? Uh, I mean, I may be getting old, but did David Cameron not try the same stunt? And was it not just a stunt? Uh, I, I, I I certainly think that with all of the changes in Downing Street at the moment, it is likely that we are seeing an attempt by Johnson to reboot or recast his uh, catastrophically disorganised administration. Uh, and in the same way as Dominic Cummings prancing about on the doorstep of number 10 on Friday night, uh, this uh, talk of a green wash, and that's what it is, uh, is that simply another attempt to distract uh, and to perhaps keep some of his softer voters on side. So I don't think that the, that the UK government, especially a, 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 a Tory UK government, have any intention to pursue proper uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, policies and they have no intention of uh, participating in any meaningful way in international attempts to uh, to address the climate the climate crisis that we are currently under, uh, the determination to pursue a hard Brexit just tells us that that's what their priority is. A determination to move to move away from international cooperation, and in particular to move away from international cooperation with the EU on all sorts of things. But the climate crisis is the number one priority that we have at the moment, uh, and and the, the 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 policies of the UK government are to make it worse, not better. Uh, mm. I think to answer your question, however, having delivered that rant, <laughs> uh, I think I think the need to move to uh, better planned, 
uh, transportation uh, in Scotland in particular is very important. Uh, we struggle, and we've seen this year, with uh, Vic what is essentially Victorian infrastructure, which is not up to the job, either on the East Coast mainline uh, and on the rest and be thankful, for example. Uh, I think we need, despite the political pain, we need to press ahead with the Glen Sannox uh, and the other uh, CalMac ferries, uh, which are hybrids, uh, powered with hybrid engines, uh, and that is necessary. And that degree of tra that transportation is, is important. Uh, our island communities rely on ferries and aircraft mm. as lifeline, lifeline uh, transportation, uh, and so they must be maintained, uh, but improved. Uh, and I think more generally, a mixture of a, a, a range of different approaches is necessary uh, in order to address this. So uh, less cars in cities, less reliance on cars, uh, cars that are relied upon being uh, more environmentally friendly. Uh, 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 the, the major generators of, uh, uh, of emissions, which is principally shipping as I understand it, uh, being transformed in particular. Uh, and then uh, in cities, uh, I live in the west of Edinburgh and attempts to make the uh, the, the suburban streets safer and quieter have been a little bit controversial, but I think the message is getting through now. Uh, and so a range of things uh, across urban and rural and island communities uh, is necessary in order to work uh, in, for people in the, immediate, uh, in the immediate terms, but also to work for everybody in the, in the medium term and the longer term as we attempt to reverse the, uh, the, the climate crisis that is upon us. Mm, absolutely. Now, it is conference season. We have seen uh, several political parties hold their, their conferences in the last couple of weeks. The SNP, of course, is in a couple of weeks from now. Uh, yesterday, and we will talk about this in a moment, we saw the All Under One Banner Assembly, but the STUC uh, have their Congress coming up very soon. So, Roz, tell us, uh, what's, what's on the agenda for the, the upcoming conference? Well, we have three key themes on the agenda. Uh, the first and very important theme is dealing with a response to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, Scottish workers have been all workers have been at the very heart of this crisis. And we have been working intensely to support their safety and to make sure that particularly key workers and essential workers have been looking after all of us uh, Many of us were locked up at home uh, as we face what's going to be a long, hard winter for them. We need to do a bit more than just giving them flaps and windows. We should be giving them a decent day down and making sure that they have the resources required to do the job and do everything we can from a public safety point of view to protect our NHS and other essential services to get us through this winter. We're obviously also talking about the economy and uh, we need to make sure that there's a safety package there. If we expect people to comply with regulations to protect them, then they need to be able to rely on a proper package of support. And so we are arguing that that needs to be stronger. Uh, the UK sick pay, for example, is the worst out of the 37 OECD countries across the world. And how can you expect people to isolate if you have to make a choice between keeping their kids and doing the right thing? So we're arguing, as we go forward, economy-wise, that we need a people's recovery in Scotland. Uh, as trade unionists, we don't think that going back to normal or how things were is good enough. Mm -hmm. The gap between the rich and the poor is growing. We had record levels of in-work poverty. A quarter of our kids were living below the poverty line. This is not the sort of economy that we should and could be driving. So we need a different track for Scotland's economy based on high quality, sustainable jobs. And that's it's going to take a lot in a different direction. And the third area that we'll be looking at in our Congress will be looking at constitutional issues and a Scotland fit for the future. We want to see a Scotland where social justice comes top of the agenda and whatever your views might be on a, a future referendum or indeed uh, the, the need for uh, to go more devolution of powers or independence or unionism, 
we want to make sure that we have the mechanisms and the powers required for Scotland to actually deliver greater social justice and a better quality of living for most working people. Now, when you look at this uh, question of recovery from the, the, the pandemic, a lot of people have talked about the idea of building back better, and we've had discussions on the show with uh, the Commonweal, with the Wellbeing Economics Alliance uh, and others talking about that kind of recovery. Uh, what are your hopes? Do you, do you see an appetite for, for real change to the way the economy works coming out of the pandemic? from either the, the UK or the Scottish Government? I think we can see an appetite now coming from the people themselves. Mm. And for me, this reminds me a lot of the change in Britain was in when it came out of World War II. We've been through a huge crisis and there are lessons to be learned from this crisis. One of the lessons is that bad jobs kill. Mm. Another lesson is that we need to start investing in our public services and that austerity has done undue damage to their ability to react to this crisis. And let us remember that when we came out of World War II, the British working classes argued for and won the NHS, a massive house building programme, the welfare state. And we need our governments to be bold and ambitious and give us the sort of reboot their whole economic system that, that people require. People are realising that the GDP or the rate of growth as a country is meaningless and the gap between the rich and the poor keeps getting bigger and bigger. We've got the highest drug deaths in Europe, the mortality levels in areas of Glasgow that look like a third world country. This is not good enough. The current system is failing us. And um when you when you say that, obviously you you also mentioned constitutional issues, um, and the STUC recently took quite a strong position on uh, Scotland's right to to choose its own future. I wonder what uh, led to the the STUC kind of taking that stronger position, and is this something where the the STUC or perhaps individual unions you might expect in a, a potential future independence referendum to to take? the side of independence? Well, what what uh, came out in the media was our draft document that we circulated to affiliates, and that document is the basis of what will be debated at Congress on Tuesday. And what the General Council is putting forward is that we absolutely should be supporting the sovereignty of the Scottish people to determine their future at a time determined by them, not determined by Westminster. But it's important that that's not mistaken for a position either pro-independent or against independent, or indeed uh, that we don't rule out the, the need potentially for a first option to be in that ballot paper. And I think what the STUC are saying at this point in time is that we want to see all political parties bringing forward their constitutional options for the Scottish people. And we want to see what that's going to deliver in terms of providing a more socially just Scotland. Mm. Because I have to say, an independent Scotland based on a neoliberal vote commission type model would be just as unpalatable for working people and would do nothing to change the status quo as having a centralised, London-based, unionist uh, way forward uh, for our country. So it's, it's not just about what type of constitutional arrangements we have, it's what, what, what are they going to deliver? Are we going to have the power to need and the resources we need to deliver real systematic change for working people and start to lift people out of poverty and give people the sort of justice they deserve. Mm. Well, that does bring me rather neatly on to the All Under One Banner Assembly, which was held yesterday online. And Andrew, uh, you were one of the major hosts of that. You uh, steered people very well through it. I saw a lot of praise uh, for your, your performance yesterday. Uh, so when you hear Roz talking about that, the idea that uh, the, the STUC potentially now getting behind this idea of Scotland uh, having the right to choose, and this being a, a, a movement of people, this is something that 
you saw quite a lot of yesterday. Yes, Kenny. Uh, we, we we had a small assembly, uh, a physical assembly back in February, and in, in the in the current COVID times, it was important to come up with a platform uh, for people uh, that would work, and so we. Uh, used an online conferencing platform yesterday uh, as a proof of concept, if you will, uh, and I think it went pretty well. Uh, I, 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 I think it's very clear that the that the SD, it is of course very clear that the SDUC is a is a is a hugely democratic and a fundamentally democratic organisation, and that is, and that is, and 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 that perhaps explains, if it needed explaining, the the support that the SDUC has demonstrated for people's democratic rights uh, and so the plat the, the assembly yesterday really was a rep was a representation of that all under one banner as a grassroots organization uh, and the purpose in assembly yesterday was to provide a platform for people people to meet and talk and discuss and debate uh, in a manner that they would otherwise have done perhaps in a public meeting however I will say that tying back to a discussion we had a moment ago uh, Whilst moving to a, an online world can be tough for people and it's confusing and it's difficult uh, and and it means that I spend an awful lot of time now sitting with this bookcase behind me, uh, mm -hmm. but the, the, the assembly yesterday showed that we can bring together people. We had uh, people joining from Sky, from Barra, from the, from the borders, all across Scotland in a manner that just frankly wasn't possible in the old world. Uh, and so I think there are uh, there are there are lessons there for political organisations and for movements, uh, which show that uh, whilst we would, of course, we would much rather be gathering together, but in a time when we can't, there are actually some silver linings here. Uh, we can bring together people from effectively all over the world, cheaply and efficiently and quickly. Uh, and and interestingly, we can, and we're, it's something we're still exploring. But interestingly, the the online uh, conferencing uh, has some accessibility benefits. Uh, 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 Kizzy Wiz, who's been tweeting the show, and I've seen her tweets going past. I I saw her I, I saw her at the conference yesterday, and she was explaining, and I'm sure she won't mind me telling you, uh, she's been a member of the SNP for 56 years. Uh, due to disability issues, uh, she has never attended a political conference in her life. And she's been a party member for almost 60 years. Assembly yesterday was the first political conference of any sort that she's been able to attend. Uh, so I think there are some lessons there too. So we were encouraged uh, and we were able to provide a platform for the people to have a discussion. Uh, and and that I think has been has been widely, widely well received. Mm. Well, I mean, certainly from my point of view, it looked like it was, uh, it did work, everything did work pretty well. Um, now, you mentioned people joining from Barra and from Sky, and I just wanted to come to those two uh, particular people that I think you're thinking of. Um, coming in from Sky, Ian Blackford, of course, uh, was interviewed by Leslie Riddich, uh, talked a wee bit about the where the independence movement is going. And in, in a, a move that actually was revealed exclusively first on uh, Friday's uh, Scotland at Seven, here with me, uh, Ian Blackford said that he expected uh, that the, the independence movement should be planning for a referendum next September. Um, I wonder what you made of what Ian Blackford had to say and perhaps the, the reaction that some people had to that. Well, it's a good point, Kenny. Uh, I think uh, Ian, I think Mr. Blackford was was making the same point that Mike Russell has made. Uh, so in that sense, it's not news. Uh, I think that the leader of the party in Westminster was making the point uh, with you, and he made the point again yesterday, I think is, is important. Uh, and I think I, I, my own perspective, this is my own perspective, uh, is that it, it's been important from the grassroots uh, approach to be giving uh, politicians like Mr. Blackford the opportunity to speak directly to independent supporters on a broader basis than speaking at a party conference, remember. Uh, it's been important to give, them a ch give, give him the opportunity to talk to the movement and the movement a chance to talk to him. Uh, and that we will, we, we will see, from my own perspective, uh, he has made his intent, his plans and his aspirations clear uh, and either he will either deliver on them or he will not. Uh, and if he delivers on them, that's great. Uh, if he doesn't deliver on them, then 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 that will be that will be a problem for him. 
Mm. Uh, so I think it's important that we have the opportunity to have these discussions. I was extreme. I, we are all grateful to everybody who spoke yesterday, whether or not they're elected politicians. Uh, but again, uh, an online platform meant that it was easy for, for politicians from all over the country to join, make a contribution, and then go about their normal, their other Saturday afternoon business with surgeries or discussions or working for their cons for their constituents. Uh, so that worked well too, I think. So I think it was important to give them to give the to give them that opportunity for the, that discussion. Uh, I think I'm personally I'm encouraged uh, that uh, there is a suggestion that uh, a September date is there. I think a September date makes sense, uh, especially in terms of campaigning on the streets of towns and cities across Scotland in the summer, uh, because doing that uh, as somebody who was on the streets during the general election campaign in December. Uh, 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 for all manner of reasons, not least the number of jackets, wellies and everything else that's required to campaign on the streets in Scotland in December, uh, it, it, it's a much more productive and pleasant uh, experience in the summer months. So September makes sense to me and I'm looking forward to that, that, coming, that coming to pass. Mm. And just before we, we wrap up, we also uh, you also mentioned people coming in from Barra and one of those obviously was Angus Brendan McNeil MP. Uh, now he was rather less confident about the, the Scottish government's uh, urgency in pursuing independence and perhaps felt that some of the tactics were wrong. Um, do you feel that there is now a, 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 almost a momentum uh, behind or with these announcements from Ian Blackford, Mike Russell, uh, with the all under one banner now kind of generating itself into a, into a, a member organisation that, that was discussed heavily yesterday? Do you think now there is a, a momentum that the even if the SNP and the Scottish government are a bit reticent, that this momentum will will be unstoppable now over the next year or so? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, I think uh, organising in the Yes movement, the broad Yes movement, uh, which is obviously is wider than the SNP. Uh, I think organising in the Yes movement is important now because it, it does two things. It, it does give a sense of urgency. It adds to the sense of urgency. But it also demonstrates to politicians that they have broad, uh, wide majority public support. Uh, and I think that uh, whilst the SNP polls very well, I think to have confidence in the likelihood of success of an independence referendum, uh, I think a, a larger and more uh, focused and organised movement is necessary. Now, I know that a number of organisations are looking at that. SIC is about to come forward with a number of initiatives. Uh, the uh, the uh, attempts to establish a national YES network, uh, bringing together YES groups across the country is underway and is working very well too. Uh, and All Under One Banner is talking to all of those organisations in different ways uh, to make sure that we're aligned. Uh, I think I think it's important that uh, the, 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 the YES movement is, is, is given a, a little more focus and di fo not direction is the wrong word, a little more focus uh, and that we can provide focus on independence uh, and that we can demonstrate the, the strength of the movement uh, in all sorts of ways. We've been able to demonstrate the growth and strength of the movement with marches and rallies in the, on, the, on the streets of towns and cities across Scotland before. Now we can do it in other ways as well uh, and I think that is important. Mm. Well, that seems like a perfect place to end today's shows. So thank you very much to Andrew Wilson and to Ros Foyers. It's been a pleasure to have both of you here. And thank you at home for joining us as well. There would be no point in making the shows at all if we didn't have you. So thank you very much. Uh, we do have to ask if you're able to support us financially, then please do go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash register and sign up there as a supporter. Your £5 a month is what keeps Broadcasting Scotland keeping on producing these shows. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, launching a crowdfunder sometime very soon. Uh, the, there's just a few wee odds and ends we need to sort out before we can launch it. Um, but we are looking now at potentially employing staff. That is the, the next big step uh, if we can raise enough money to make that happen. So we, we would urge you just to keep an eye out for that crowdfunder and maybe if you want to put a couple of quid aside for it, uh, then that would be great. If you're not able to support us financially, I know we talk about money a lot, but you, you can still make a big, big difference for us by uh, following us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott, by liking our Facebook page, by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking the bell icon there as well. 
Um, all of that helps us with the algorithms. It helps us just stay m more high profile. But it also uh, gives you the opportunity to share these shows around with people. We do put out uh, tweets and, and Facebook notices about every show that we, we put out. So please share those around with people. Let people know where we are, what we do, and why you think we're worth having a look at. And as I said, we are looking potentially at employing some staff very soon. But next year is going to be a very busy year. We will definitely have an election to cover and potentially now, as I say, we may be looking at uh, an independence referendum to cover in the autumn. That's going to take more than just the, the people we can pay to work here. Uh, we will need volunteers as well. So if you're interested in getting involved in building a better broadcaster for Scotland, then please do get in touch with us. There are lots of roles in front of and behind the camera. So wherever you are in the country, uh, please do get in touch with us if you think you'd like to get involved. But that is absolutely all we have time for tonight. So once again, I would like to thank Andrew Wilson and Ros Foyers for joining us. Gordon will be back again tomorrow at 7 with Scotland at 7. I'll be back on Tuesday at the same time. But until then, thank you very much for joining us and have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Tremendous.